all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Foods for the stomach and the stomach for foods, but God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body, and God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Now as we get into our study, I need to remind you of some of the things that Paul has been, been stating. And one of the things that is going to help us as we get into this passage before us, one of the things that will help us to understand what Paul is saying is we need to remember something he's already said. Paul has already said that the unrighteous, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. He wanted to be very clear about that, and that's why in verse 9 he made it very clear by saying, Do not be deceived. Do not yield to any arguments that state differently. Now, Scripture has much to say concerning our need to be on guard against spiritual deception. You can go throughout the New Testament and find warning after warning. As a matter of fact, spiritual deception is the uh, premier sign that we're living in the last days. When the Lord Jesus Christ was asked concerning the signs of his coming and how are they going to know when he's about to, uh, to return, the first thing Jesus said is, uh, be careful that you're not deceived. And so deception, spiritual deception, is a sign that you're in the last days. And so the New Testament especially says quite a, few, quite a number of things related to spiritual deception and the need for us to be on guard. In Ephesians, for example, in chapter 5, verses 3 through 6, Paul said, But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Over and over again, we have warnings given to us in Scripture concerning the fact that there will be those who attempt to deceive us. To make light of sin and to broaden it in such a way in terms of our abilities to do a lot of things, that it diminishes the holiness of God and actually begins to undermine the grace of God. We need to have protection from deception, and the source of our protection is God's word. James, in chapter 1, verse 22 of his book, said, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. He says, Do what it says. And so the way that we're protected is by hearing the word of God and actually doing it. Charles Spurgeon once said, I remember a story of one who remarked to a minister what a wonderful thing it was to see so many people weeping. No, said he, I will tell you something more amazing still, that so many will forget all they wept about when they get outside the door. And that's true. During many powerful messages, we might be pierced by the Spirit with conviction in our hearts. And it can cause us to sometimes tear up because, behold, I'm that person that's being spoken of today and I feel terrible about it. And I can actually weep in the sanctuary. But Spurgeon was right when he said the real problem is, is that we forget once we're outside the door what we were weeping about. So it's not enough for me to hear the word it's to hear the word and to obey. Now, Paul was speaking here in this passage, and he had stated that some of the Corinthians had been committing various sins. We looked at some of those sins last time we were together. Now he is stating that no one's going to inherit the kingdom of God in that continuing condition. Again, in verse 9, he said, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, that's one of the reasons why God sent Jesus to planet Earth, in order that he might redeem us. First Peter 3.18 says, For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit. 
He had come to bring us to a relationship with his father. And so the one who would argue that you can continue to sin doesn't understand grace. And that's what Paul is going to deal with here in verses 12 through 20. He's going to be dealing with that reality. Now, he's been dealing with the subject of fornication, but he begins by presenting a general rule. And after establishing a general rule, he deals specifically with this particular sin. Now, in verse 12, he says, All things are lawful to me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Now, it's commonly believed that that was a common saying during his day. It was something that the people would be familiar with. And so he's speaking about all things being lawful to him. This is something, by the way, he's going to repeat in chapter 10, verse 23. All things are lawful, he's saying, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful is another way of saying that all things are allowed. What he's saying is Christian liberty. He's speaking of Christian liberty. Not what a person can do, but what a person may do. All things may be lawful, but not all things are helpful. Now, one of the things I want to speak about, and I want to lay a foundation by looking at this, is what uh, the purpose of grace is. I mean, over the years, I've come to realize that sometimes we have a misunderstanding of God's grace. God's grace, the word grace means unmerited favor. The Greek word is charis. And so there are some who have named their children charis because they love the name grace. And, uh, and it's a beautiful word, and it's a beautiful concept. Unmerited favor, undeserved favor from God. We receive something from God that we do not in any way earn for ourselves. He, he gives it to us freely, and he gives it to us without any merit on our, on our part. God's grace. And, and God's grace is saturating the life of the believer. As a matter of fact, like the uh, birds of the air use the air to fly, and like the fish you know, are in the ocean because that's their environment and all. Well, we as Christians, our environment is God's grace. God has given us his grace. We're saved by the grace of God. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5 says, Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. So we have been saved through God's grace. We also serve the Lord by his grace. Romans 5, 17 says, If by the trespass of one man, death reigned through that one man. How much more will those who receive Christ's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? We're saved by grace. We serve God by grace. And so we are saved by God's grace that we might serve God by his grace. Now, being in the grace of God means that we are no longer under bondage. That's why in Galatians 5.1, he says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. So we're saved by the grace of God to serve God by the grace of God, freed from the, from the uh, bondage of sin, so that we might in freedom serve Jesus Christ. But like many in the church today, the Corinthians were perverting God's grace into permission to continue in sin. And they confused liberty with license and began to be lax in their moral behavior. There are three words that I like to use when I speak concerning this subject. One is the word liberty. The other is license. There's another word I usually use. I didn't include it in this study, but I'll insert it here, and that's legalism. You have some people who are caught up with legalism. I don't smoke, and I don't chew, and I don't date girls who do. You know that kind of mentality? It's not um, so much what they are, it's what they're not doing. It's what they don't permit themselves to do. So everything, you know, for them is wrong. They'll come to a church and they'll say, everything's wrong with that church. I mean, they have rock and roll guitars up there. They have drums up there. I can remember when I first got saved, um, there were all kinds of people upset over Maranatha music, which is tame today. But they were real upset with it because they said, you're bringing in voodoo drums into the sanctuary of God. They actually did. That's a quote. They said, you're bringing in voodoo, the beat. It's, it's a hypnotic thing, and it's causing people to turn into zombies. It was really an interesting thing I said to Raul. You shouldn't say that, Raul, but he did. 
voodoo. And they were so upset. They'd be so upset. You know, they'd look at us when we were, you know, saved and we had the long hair and so, and we'll be seeing this later on as we study Corinthians. They'll say, is, you know, does not nature itself teach you that it's, it's wrong? It's a shame to have long hair? And they go into this whole thing about why you're not supposed to have long hair. It's like Jesus had a crew cut and a trimmed beard. You know, it made no sense to me at all then. It still makes no sense now, but it was legalism. You can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this. And, and the more, you know, stringent you are and the more restricted you are, well, the holier you are. And then you have the other ones who are into license. You can do anything you want. God's grace is so incredible. If you want to go out and get boozed up and sleep around, that's fine. Because you know what? It's, it's, it really doesn't matter. It's just your body, not your spirit. And so there were those who would argue that. You can still smoke pot. You know, it's an herb. And didn't God make the herb for us to enjoy? And I had people saying that. We called it herb at that time, though it's really it's also called weed. But, um, and they would argue that. They would say, you can have that. You can use that. And there are still religious systems today that use marijuana as like a sacrament. And so you had some on the one hand who said, you can't do anything. And then you had some on the other hand who said, you can do anything. And so you've got legalism on the one hand. You have license on the other hand. But what God has given to us is liberty. Liberty is freedom in Christ. All things are lawful to me is the state of one who has been set free. We have liberty in Jesus Christ, but not all things build me up. I'm not under the law any longer. I'm free in Christ. I can go out and eat some pork chops and I won't go to hell. I can, I can do those things that the religious Jew could not do because of the ritualism of his religious faith. I have freedom in Christ. But do I use my freedom as a cloak to cover over unrighteousness? Do I, in other words, continue to do things that are immoral and wrong and all along say I'm doing it because I'm free in Jesus Christ? What had happened is they had confused liberty with license and as a result of that began to be lax in their moral behavior. In Galatians 5.13, Paul said it like this. He said, brethren, you have been called to liberty only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. In 1 Peter 2, verse 16, the apostle writes, Live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. Romans 6, 1 and 2, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? <laughs> by no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it? any longer. Nowhere does the Bible teach us that once you're saved, you can go out and continue to do everything you want, stay in sin, because that only reveals that we don't understand the grace of God. And it only reveals that we don't understand the depth of our own depravity. And sometimes people will use the grace of God to give them permission to continue in sin. And it would seem apparent that Paul has to deal with that in the Corinthian church. You cannot legitimize sinful habits by cheapening the grace of God. We need to remember that we've been saved and set free from that kind of life. In Romans chapter 6, verses 15 through 17, Paul said, What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? <laughs> by no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey? Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. You see, the Corinthians were saying, all things are lawful for me. One author said other religions prescribed rules which men must keep if they would be saved. Food laws were especially common. The abstaining from all unlawful things was necessary part of attaining salvation. Not so with Christianity. The believer will avoid evil and unhelpful things, but this does not earn his salvation. Salvation is all of grace. It depends on what God has done in Christ. The believer is not hedged around with a multitude of restrictions in order to be saved. 
In this very large sense, all things are lawful for him. You see, every sin I commit as a Christian is forgivable. And that's because I'm not saved by my works or my own righteousness. And though every sin is forgivable, not all things are profitable. Not all things are to my advantage. Paul was saying, I refuse to be brought under the power of any perceived liberty. I've had a few letters in the past from members of our fellowship when I have said things related to uh, just general life. I mean, how I can live to, to bring glory to God and how I can live to put myself in a position of being used by him. And I've said things related to, you know, some general things. And they're not even in my notes. I just kind of like bring them out. Yeah, I'm over 21, have been for a long time. Yeah, I can go to a club if I want. I can drink and I can do all kinds of things if I want. Will I go to hell because I had a beer? No. Will I go to hell because I do certain things? No, I'm saved by the grace of God. I'm free in Christ. If I had a beer or I've had a wine or whatever, yeah, I'm not suddenly going to look around you know, for Jesus with a, with a mallet and smash me and say, oh, you're going to hell now. I'm not concerned with that. Marie might, but not Jesus. <laughs> well, Pastor, you were speaking about, uh, this is not a, in a direct quote, but this is the thought of one letter. You say that we should avoid drinking. Why? What's wrong with it? I enjoy beer once in a while. I enjoy some wine once in a while. Are you saying that I, by the grace of God, cannot have a beer? Anybody who argues with me on that light is normally an individual who enjoys their freedoms, and I begin to wonder of what use are they in the kingdom of God. I, I begin to wonder if they're sharing their faith with people. I begin to wonder if they care about the lost. I begin to wonder what their love is for others because you have legalism, you have liberty, you have license, but the most important word is love. And, and I restrict my behavior and the freedoms that I have based on the fact that I've been set free by Jesus Christ to love him and love others. And I just want to be in the position where I can minister at any given time. I just want to be able to do that. That I can, I can, without any remorse, begin to share a gospel with somebody and not be thinking, well, I'm speaking beyond what I'm living. And so for me, a long time ago, I made the decision that I simply wanted to live a life that was right before God which gives me the freedom to speak with a clean conscience and gives me the ability to speak with conviction because I know that God works through these things. It's that simple. It's, it's just loving people and restricting the things that may have, you may have freedom to do, restricting those things so that you always are free to be able to do at least this one thing, and that is to share the love of Christ with people. To me, that's very important. Maybe it's not to everybody else. But to me, it is. I've shared this before. Some of you have heard this story. I was in a uh, pizza parlor with a friend of mine. And uh, I was about 24 years old or so at the time, right in that area. And he had been raised in a Christian home, and he was now discovering his freedoms and liberties. So he said, I understand that. Pizza tastes really good with beer. I said, yeah, let's get some. So I ordered a pitcher for us, not just for myself. There was a time when I'd gotten two pitchers, but this is a different time. And so I ordered a pitcher. And he pours a beer, and I pour a beer, and I've got the beer in front of me. I took a drink from it, put it down. I'm not feeling real comfortable with this. I'm thinking this probably isn't something I need to do. I, I got saved to get away from this. What am I doing? And I'm, I'm going through that. When this older gentleman comes walking in, and we were in these picnic-style tables, and I was seated facing my friend, so directly behind him on this other table, this older man comes in, and he sits down in such a way that he's facing me. And as he's facing me, I have this beer in front of me. I have this pitcher in front of me. 
And the Spirit of the Lord says to me, and I'll never forget this, and I've shared this before, go and share my love with that man. And I, I said, I can't. I remember this very well, like it was yesterday. I can't. And a voice in my heart spoke and said, why not? Because I have beer in front of me, and he sees it, and it's undermining my credibility. I can't. And as God is my witness, as I was seated there speaking to this inner voice, if you will, praying, I saw two people walk in from the street. One sat on this man's left hand, the other sat on his right, and one of them pulled out a pocket Bible, opened it up, and began to share the gospel with this man right in front of me. And the voice of the Lord spoke to my heart and said, if I cannot use you, I will find somebody else to use. I have never forgotten that. That's a true story. If I cannot use you, I will find somebody else to use. And that was one of those triggers in my life that changed the whole direction. So my perceived freedoms, who, I wouldn't argue that it was necessarily a sin for me to have one beer and a couple pieces of pizza. I'm not sitting here restricting your freedoms. I'm simply saying that for love's sake, I restrict my liberties. For love's sake, for other people, I restrict what is possibly I'm free to do. So I don't get into arguments with people when they come and say, are you saying I can't go to the club? You know, I'm going to meet my significant person there. I'm sure you will. I'm sure you will. I'm sure the Virgin Mary shows up to dance every Friday night. I'm positive you're right about that. Liberty, license, legalism, love. I just want to walk in the freedom of Jesus Christ. Yes, all things are lawful for me but all things are not helpful. I may be free in Christ, but I'm not to be brought into the bondage of anything. Now, Paul knew that the Corinthians were aware of that, that phrase, of that, uh, that saying. And so he's saying this to them. He's saying, I refuse to be brought under the power of any perceived liberty, and I will not deceive myself into thinking that I can continue in sin and not be chastened by God. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 6 and 7, we read, The Lord disciplines those he loves. He punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as, a, as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? So the Corinthians were known. Those in Corinth were known for sexual license. They were known for their immorality. And Paul is, again, dealing with sexual sin. He's dealing with fornication. Because notice what he says in verse 13. This is a saying amongst the Corinthians. Foods for the stomach and the stomach for foods. But God will destroy both it and them. The body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. So there's this saying amongst the Corinthians. And, and basically, when it says uh, food for the belly and the belly for foods, it's simply saying we have natural appetites. If you're hungry, that's a natural appetite. Feed yourself. If you're thirsty, that's a natural drive. Drink. So if I have a natural drive to eat and I have a natural drive to drink, I also have a biological drive to, uh, to have uh, sexual intimacy. So because it's just a natural drive, why would it be wrong for me to, to meet that drive's need? So if I'm hungry, I eat. If I'm thirsty, I drink. If I have a desire to be intimate with someone, just be intimate. And that was the way they thought during that time. They're saying sexual satisfaction is just a natural appetite. Satisfy it. But it's been said that no other sin a person commits has more destructiveness than sexual sin. It has broken more marriages, shattered more homes, and cause more heartache than alcohol and drugs combined. It causes lying, cheating, stealing, killing, bitterness, hatred, slander, gossip, and unforgiveness. 
sexual sin is particularly terrible because it's deceitful. Sexual sin is deceitful because it never delivers what it promises, no matter how many movies you may see produced by Hollywood. It never delivers what it promises. It's deceitful. Sexual sin is unstable because nothing binds us but lust. And what happens when I lose sexual interest in that person? And sexual sin is destructive because it always results in loss. You will lose your family. You will lose your friendships. You lose self-respect. You can lose your health, and you can lose your possessions. It's destructive. We're not to be mastered by our desires. God has given to us something through the Holy Spirit that gives us the ability to deal with these drives, and that's called self-control. In Galatians 5, and 23, it says the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Self-control. I've said this before. Some of you have heard me say this. In this age of HIV AIDS, you go to a club, you meet somebody. We'll take it from a male perspective. A man goes to the club, meets a young lady. They get friendly. He invites her to come home with him. She comes home. They're there in his front room. They're talking. They're beginning to, to get physically intimate. All of the bells and whistles are beginning to go off in this person. He doesn't care that he's a believer. She's available to him. He wants to be with her. And so they begin to move towards intercourse. But she says to him, you just need to know something. I am HIV positive, and you can get AIDS if you have intercourse with me. Do you think he's going to say, oh, that's cool, no problem? I don't think so. I think all of a sudden it's like a bucket of ice water just is poured on top of this guy, and he says, you know what? Time to get you out of here. See, the fear of AIDS kept him from doing something that the fear of God was intended to do. He has a greater fear of AIDS than he has of God because his mind is thinking that God's grace is sufficient. He's already made excuses in his mind. All things are lawful to me. I'm not going to go to hell. I'll repent from this. He's already messed around with this theology enough to give him permission to sin. But when that woman says to him, if you consummate this, you will get HIV, all of a sudden he cools down instantly and is, he's not interested anymore. So is that self-control? Yeah, in a sense. He made a decision not to do something. He controlled himself, but it wasn't because of his love for Christ. It wasn't because of his fear of God. It was because of his fear of AIDS. So he does have the ability to exercise self-control. He just chooses not to. He just says, I don't want to. What's the point of doing that? Until he realizes the consequence. So God has given to us something that should keep us out of that situation, and that's the Spirit of God, and the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. In Romans chapter 6, verses 11 through 14, it says, In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master, because you're not under law, but under grace. God gives you the ability to say no to sin. He gives us the power of the Holy Spirit to resist the, the temptation. It's just that sometimes we just choose not to. You see, in verses 13 and 14, stomach for food, but God will destroy both it and them. Well, obviously, the relationship of food in the digestive tract is temporary. But the body, well, the body is to be used for the Lord's glory. Ultimately, we will, we will wear these bodies glorified and capable of living in heaven through eternity. And so food is temporary, but God's work in us is permanent. Now, he asks a question in verse 15. Do you not know that your bodies 
are members of Christ. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Spirit of God? Well, that's a powerful thought when you think about it deeply. You got saved. The Holy Spirit convicted you of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He heard the gospel message that declared that, that you were lost, that I was lost. But that God loved us so much, he sent his son Jesus to retrieve us. Seeing that we were in the marketplace of sin, sold and in bondage, Jesus Christ came in order to redeem us, to buy us back. So he went into that marketplace, and the cost of my redemption for him to purchase me out of slavery was his blood. God loved the world so much that he gave his son so that Jesus Christ would voluntarily lay his life down for me. And he did that. And as he paid the cost of redemption with his blood, and the message that I could be set free by simply receiving his grace came to my ears through the gospel, and so I said, God, be merciful to me. I am a sinner. Forgive me. When I did that, I said, Jesus, come into my life and make me new. And the Bible says, you are now the temple of the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of God dwells in you. So it wasn't a work of righteousness that I'd done. It wasn't that my mom took me at uh, six months or so, four months old, and had me water baptized. It wasn't that I went through religious rituals in certain classes and then just went through certain processes to become a member of the church. It was that God's Holy Spirit convicted me. I asked him for forgiveness. Then he entered into my life by faith, and I now became his temple. He now dwells within me. God dwells within you. He dwells in us. He doesn't dwell in temples made by human hands. He dwells in you. He created you, and he dwells in you. So when you're an individual who's unmarried and you're sleeping around, Paul is saying, don't you understand that you're the temple of God and you're dragging God into your sinful activity? Don't you understand that? Now that is a powerful thought that many people don't think about. That's what he's saying here. He says, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. You're taking Jesus who dwells within you, and you're bringing him into the same relationship that your body is physically involved in. And he says, you're not understanding it. It isn't something that is light it is something that is terribly wrong. Sexual immorality is wrong. So what is his answer? Flee, verse 18, flee sexual immorality. The answer is habitually flee from it. You have a man in the Old Testament by the name of Joseph. We know the story of Joseph, so I'll just highlight it by saying he was basically as a house slave for a, a man by the name of Potiphar. Potiphar has a wife. The Bible tells us that, that Joseph was very handsome, a very appealing young man, very wise, and a tremendous charisma. And Potiphar's wife daily was looking at Joseph, and she was saying, I want this young man. And so she began to say to him, I mean, very boldly, very openly, come lie with me. Shall I sin against my master and my God by doing such a thing? He has withheld nothing from my hand except for you. There's no way that I'm going to dishonor God, and there's no way I'm going to dishonor your husband by doing this evil thing. And he refuses, but daily she's pursuing him. Daily she's after him. We know the story how that one day she finally grabs hold of him and says, come lie with me. And he 
starts to pull away, and he has a cloth on that he's wearing, and she pulls it, and it comes off of him, and he flees from her area naked. Well, her husband is informed, is told, look at what Joseph has tried to do. And that's when Joseph ended up going through some tremendous hardship, even though it was quite obvious that the woman was the one who was actually assaulting him. But what did he do? What he did is he fled. He got out, there, got out of there as fast as he could. The average man wouldn't do that. The average man probably would say, you know, what's the problem? This is a big deal. Not Joseph. Joseph had honor. He had integrity. He had a love of God. He had a fear of God. And that's what drove Joseph to fleeing fornication. We have to understand that. In our, in our day, and I won't, I won't belabor this because I'm speaking to people who know this very well. In our day, sexual sin is so common that it's celebrated. It's just celebrated. I mean, we, we have no sense of shame for the sinfulness of our behavior. We just don't. There was at one time in the United States a moral base where if, if somebody became pregnant outside of wedlock, it was something they actually felt ashamed for doing. It was, it was wrong. It shamed your parents. It shamed your friends. It shamed your family. It shamed everybody. Everybody. And uh, we even had what you called moral clauses in our laws. We had what you called undesirable alien clauses. So, so if a, foreign, a person from a foreign country wanted to come in and they were looked at as being morally improper, they would actually be refused from entering the United States. I mean, there were well-known actresses, Ingrid Bergman being one, who was refused entrance into the United States because she had an affair with somebody, became pregnant by him. She was an undesirable. They wouldn't allow them in. So our day has changed completely, hasn't it? We not only celebrate this, we go on TV speaking about, hey, look at me, like Brad and Jeline, you know, we're engaged, yeah, in sin, and now you're engaged together. But we celebrate these things. We, we make it seem like, isn't this a wonderful thing? That's how it is. And so many young people are growing up without biblical basis for their beliefs. So they're accepting of all of this. Well, Paul was ministering in a time that was very similar to what we are living in today. And he's saying, flee fornication. Have nothing to do with it. Again, in verse 19, he says, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? You were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's, or which belongs to God. You belong to God. Sex is the most intimate physical expression and sex is to be reserved for a committed marriage. Misuse of this particular gift that God gave to us destroys at the deepest level. You need to remember that you carry in your body every relationship that you've ever had, and it's something that remains with you. Your body is the temple of the Spirit of God. So Paul is simply saying, you are God's dwelling place. God has given you his spirit to strengthen you, and to live holy lives. In gratitude for your salvation, flee fornication. In gratitude for your salvation, don't make excuses to continue in sin. In thankfulness to God for what he has done, live for Jesus Christ. Live for him. Live for him. Young men should treat the young women as sisters. And the young women should treat the young men as brothers. We should treat each other with respect. And we should treat each other with love. Instead of taking from that woman that which belongs to her husband, and instead of taking from that man that which belongs to his wife, we ought to love Christ enough and love one another enough to give, us, give ourselves and give each other the freedom to live with a clean conscience. To be able to wake up in the morning and not regret what you did the night before. To have the joy of knowing that you're walking in God's ordinances, doing the right thing for his pleasure, and then watching God bless your relationships. So we have liberty. We have license. We have legalism. 
But what we really walk in is love, love for God and love for one another.